Hey guys and welcome! Today we will talk about animations. But this is a big one. We will see how animations work in code and how the character setup is done and how the animation's been set up. By the way, my name is Roma and I'm the technical evangelist. The following video you'll see was live streamed together with our very own animation programmer Claudio Freda. He will give you insights into our animation code and give you a better understanding of the animation system in CryEngine. And if you are new to this series and you might be wondering what you are currently looking at, we made a cool little game project called Breeze and introduced some parts and pieces of Breeze to you in the live streams on Twitch. You play as a small robot dropped somewhere on a low poly island, trying to find fuel to fill up your rocket and return from your vacation. During our original stream event on Twitch, each mechanic in the game was introduced one at a time, including some commentary from our resident developer experts at Crytek, who also work on our very own games. And now we are bringing you all of that and much more, as we are adding step-by-step -step tutorials to the mix enabling you to create your own island filled with beautiful low-poly assets and some platforming game mechanics you can enjoy. But this one is a live stream that we recorded with Claudio together. So enjoy the video and have fun, guys. So I guess what today we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to kind of run through um, how the animations of the characters, the character work, uh, how they've been set up. Um, I made a few changes to how the project was last time you saw it, but they're very minor just to clean up the code a little bit uh, so that I can, you know, explain it to you. And so um, maybe uh, if we can show what the uh, kind of like kind of like how the project is for people that haven't uh, participated in the previous streams. Um, <laughs> exactly. But it's kind of like a platformer game. Exactly. Right? Yeah, it is a platformer game. It is built on this island, which was built by uh, by Tom Dierbeck, one of our artists. And this level does not freaking work with uh, SSR, so I need to turn off SSR. Just yeah. real quick. Um, okay. Yeah. So exactly. And we thought uh, we had the idea to make a platformer out of this. So as you already saw, there is a rocket out here, and we have a character who wants to go home, even though it is a beautiful island. He still wants to go home and I've placed some fuel cans over here all around the level. And what you can do as a player, you can pick them up. And as soon as you pick one up, it will get attached to your back. And then you will see like some something like a path. And in this game, you should just follow this path, jump around and all of the path will lead you to the rocket up here. And as soon as you um, go through this obstacle course, you will reach this platform over here where you can actually place your can. And as soon as you got three of them together, you will be able to fly off this island and the level will be finished. So there are, again, multiple ways to finish this level. From this side, you can pick up the fuel can and then just run this course over here, which, which are just um, designer objects that I've placed um, like around the island, which will lead you to the rocket. And then you will again be able to place it right here. Um, I've used a character and animations from Mixamo to create this um, lovely robot, in my opinion. Um, of course, it does not really fit well into, into the low poly star, uh, style, um, but still, I think it's pretty awesome. The animations uh, look pretty decent for a prototype. We have a jump, we have some locomotion. And yeah, I was actually I was actually surprised that the uh, Mixamo animations have all of the you know correct pieces to make a interactive jump. I can explain that later. Yeah. Um, but it looks pretty good. Um, maybe we can start. Uh, let's start by kind of explaining how uh, well what this character has or what this character can do. Right. So this character can move around, jump. Uh, and has an idle animation, has a landing animation. So this is a very simple, simple setup. Um, and uh, we wanted kind of to show how to get a simple character into uh, CryEngine. Uh, and, you know, for a prototype game, <clears throat> just getting a dude or, well, in this case, a robot yeah. 
uh, walking around is kind of one of the most important things you want to do at the beginning because you want uh, to get something you can iterate on. So um, if we can maybe open up the mannequin editor, of course. Um, I can show um, the viewers how the character is set up. So um, we have this system in CryEngine called uh, mannequin. And uh, mannequin, uh, did you? Got it, got it. Mess? Okay, okay. There we go. Uh, we have this system called uh, Mannequin, uh, which is um, what's usually called uh, animation controller. So um, CryEngine is built on two layers of uh, animation tech. Uh, the lower layer, kind of like the um, low level stuff. Um, so what in practice is all of the blending, the math, the number crunching is in this layer called CryAnimation. And then... Um, Back when Crisis 3 was uh, was uh, developed, um, they needed a little bit more, you know, functionality for organizing and controlling animations in a logical way, and so they created uh, Mannequin. So Mannequin acts on top of CryAnimation, um, and it's kind of like a translation layer, or a, you, you could even say a dictionary of animations or a database of animations that uh, get um, requested based on based on uh, gameplay. Uh, gameplay code that you know calls into these uh, events uh, called fragments. So, um, can you open up the preview for our character? Yep. I will just be doing whatever you told me, uh, whatever you tell me. So yeah, this is this is yeah. the preview. Okay. So this is how we set up um, a character. So to be able to open up a character in Mannequin, you need to have a preview file. And that's what uh, uh, Roman just did. So the preview file uh, just tells Mannequin basically what the character to open in the preview window and then which um, uh, specific configuration to have of the editor. Since Mannequin is very complicated, it has lots and lots of settings. The preview kind of um, helps the editor understand what actually in what actual context you're editing. So in this case, this character is very simple. So it has a single context called third person uh, where you can play third person animations. Obviously on more complicated characters, you might have uh, five or six or seven or eight or 10 different uh, layers, uh, which we call scopes, uh, where you play animations for the first person, for the third person, for the shadow, for the gun, for, um, you know, if you're having a kill move animation, you might want to synchronize the animation of the player and the uh, receiver of the kill move, other stuff like that. Uh, in this case, we're focusing on a very simple example uh, since, you know, this is a introductory tutorial. Um, but maybe if some of you have questions about this, I can, I can answer them later. Uh, so if you just browse through the uh, fragments, if you maybe disable the subfolders option, so you uh, so we see them uh, more clearly. Well, how would I do that? How would I disable? Uh, it's a, there's a subfolder tick so uh, this one, right on, yeah. on top of the. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So this uh, just it's I I prefer reading them like this. Uh, yeah. In any case, it's just a matter of preference. So we have uh, idle jump, jump, land, and walk. So what you see on the left, what these folders are, uh, are uh, called uh, fragment IDs. And they each fragment ID is basically like a gameplay action or something that is uh, um, so, some sort of identifier for um, not, not really one animation, but in general, the concept of a gameplay action. Um, so these identifier identifiers get called from gameplay code uh, and mannequin reads them and translates them into you know whatever amount of animations is necessary so obviously for the idle we just have a looping idle animation um, and for the walk we have a blend space and we can we can go into the blend spaces later uh, but the blend spaces I know you already did a um, you already did a, um, a session on those so I'm not gonna go too much in detail on, on, on how to set them up uh, but maybe we can look at how the blend space parameters are controlled from code. Uh, but just that would be actually of, awesome. Yeah, that we, yeah. If, if we could just have a quick, um, quick overview on the on, on the blend spaces because I was okay, able to. Yeah, yeah. It would be awesome just to have your perspective on it as well. 
just to explain for people that don't know what a blend space is, maybe you missed the previous session. Um, blend spaces are a way to, it's kind of like the traditional way at this point to do a parametric animation. So parametric animation means that your animation um, changes depending on a uh, couple of parameters, um, which is usually um, the blend spaces are used for locomotion. So these parameters end up being uh, velocity and uh, travel angle. Uh, so speed and angle so that you can have a character that moves uh, seamlessly depend independently of um, you can have like smooth locomotion all around these two parameters uh, independently of where you're aiming your stick uh, your movement stick or your WASD keys uh, that mm -hmm. the character will always follow um, the uh, correct trajectory and blend in between slower animations, faster animations, uh, forward, left, right animations. Uh, and it enables the animation system to decide and create a new animation that walks in exactly the correct trajectory. And uh, you can get much, much uh, more complicated with blend spaces because in CryEngine we support uh, up to 4D. And well, if you, if you really like XML, you technically can go up to 5D, but yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Um, um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we support uh, quite a lot of, um, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of stuff with blend spaces and you can, you can go uh, very high dimensionality. Um, so yeah, they're used for step rotates, uh, speed is mesh. That's a good 1D example. That's right. Um, they're used for maybe vaulting in some games where you might want to, you know, have a, a parametric vault height. So you, you record a vault for a smaller smaller obstacle, larger obstacle, and an even larger obstacle. And then if they're similar enough, you can blend between them with a 1D blend space. Um, we also use them in some cases for like stopping and starting animations. In that case, the obviously the um, uh, parameters are different. So it might be like a starting angle. So the difference between the velocity and the orientation of the character. And you, you can do really a lot of things, and it's kind of like the traditional way to do parametric animation. Um, yeah, the, about the 4D, I think Crisis 3 is actually using 4D blend spaces uh, most of the times because the characters adapt their locomotion based on um, travel speed, travel angle, uh, inclination, so the tilt of the, um, the tilt of the, um, uh, of the ground and also the current rotation velocity. Uh, so even so, the even the tilt. Yes. Yeah. That's in the Crisis Three. Wow. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty complicated blend space, um, and uh, it's um, uh, we we technically support up to 4D. It's just that at a certain point the editor kind of fails because it, you can't show a 4D blend space. Um, yeah, you have to use combis. Uh, speed is meh. Yeah, exactly. He's uh, he's completely right. Um, so we we uh, obviously you you can uh, use combination blend spaces, which is like blending between blend spaces to make it easier to look at it. Look at it because displaying 4D and in, uh, in the editor is well not possible. Or well, you could do it, but I'm sure that it would just blow people's heads. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I mean that's it. This is what blend spaces is, and basically you see that little dot right there. And if you uh, fiddle with the uh, parameters, which I believe should be, uh, if you scroll up on the right pane, uh, you're looking at the right pane of the character tool, right? Um, there's like a properties tab. All right. Uh, oh no! Actually, under scene parameters on the top right of the character tool, just expand that. There's a little window that is contract uh, compressed. Ah, uh, there we go. Above the properties. Yeah. 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 And uh, I'm looking at the Twitch stream because I can't see character tool from your uh, screen share. Oh, but you, uh, you don't uh, see it on Discord. No, I don't see it on the Discord screen share. I just see the... If you could share your screen instead of the application. Well, I, I did share my screen. I think um, that... Oh, I think it, it froze. Okay, yeah, but this should... Wait. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, okay, now it's fixed. You should be seeing everything that I'm seeing right now. Yes, now I do. Yeah, uh, so perfect. if you open uh, the, there's a little arrow next to locomotion.bspace in yeah. the preview, and you can fiddle with the parameters there. So if you fiddle with the parameters, um, you see that the little dot moves around. Yeah. And when it moves around in those uh, squares, and each square has uh, different weights set up for all of the example animations, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, this allows the um, uh, system to know which animation is actually supposed to blend between. And it does also time-based blending. It synchronizes the food steps. So that's pretty, pretty advanced stuff. It's, it's pretty, uh, you know, I mean, I think the CryEngine blend space backend is pretty state of the art. Um, the editor is not the easiest thing to use, but the as, as far as the backend goes, is basically all you need when it comes to blend spacing. Uh, so if you just uh, cut out the blend space preview and just uh, fiddle with the parameters, uh, and you can maybe show the no, no. If you uh, just close the blend space preview, you can yeah. just look at the normal preview, and if you fiddle with the parameters, uh, maybe increase. You see that the characters, you know, starts running. If you change the angle, starts you know moving backwards. Maybe if you change the travel angle, see the yeah. Even you know now the the, the speed is incredibly fast. So if he starts moving backwards, the animation is going to be distorted. But that's also what this allows you to do. It even works when the animation is not right or is not like if you even if you don't have that animation, it will try to um, generate something. Uh, it, by extrapolating the others, uh, generate something that kind of works. Uh, so if you have a lower travel speed and you walk backwards, then it then you, should, you should have a pleasing animation. Um, so the travel angle, I think it's uh, when it's zero, it's forwards, and when it's um, I think it's in must be in radians or something. Uh, but yeah, I mean you can play with this. Uh, there's several examples in game SDK as well. So. Um, this is basically what we use for uh, locomotion, and it's treated by the uh, low-level animation system as a uh, as if it was a standard animation, right? So it, there's nothing really special. Um, the only additional thing you have to do is pass the parameters uh, to the system, which we're going to see how to do in C++. Awesome! I can't so, wait to do this. But this yeah. is like actually a lot of information that even I <laughs> knew before that I could actually preview the motion and the speed of the animation right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, um, is, yeah, this is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a, it becomes uh, if you don't have that then it's uh, pretty annoying to have to um, debug them. So that's why they made it, made it this way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe we can go back to the mannequin uh, editor so I can show how you know this comes into mannequin. Sure. And we're back. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. I'm still. I was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the. Um, uh, sorry. I'm switching windows. So I, I'm not seeing. You don't worry. Okay. Great. Yeah. So if we going back to the walk animation. Yeah. Um, uh, you see that there's uh, for each of these uh, fragment IDs on the left, which are the folders. Uh, so the fragment IDs are just names. Uh, there's nothing particularly crazy about that it's just a dictionary if you think about it like a dictionary probably is the easiest way to think about it so each of these can have a number of different implementations so right now we're running with a single one for to make things simple uh, you can have variants so if i would add up. another one for example if i would uh, add a new fragment entry um yeah those two will be played randomly right yeah exactly yeah okay. if they have if they don't have anything specified then they are going to be played randomly. Uh, then, additionally, uh, additionally, you can tag a different um, uh, implementations, different fragments um, with uh, gameplay tags. Uh, so, for example, like crouching, or if it, the character is wounded, or something like that. Uh, and in that case, uh, it will not choose randomly. It will choose the best matching one. Uh, so you set the gameplay tags onto the mannequin controller, you pass them onto the mannequin controller. And uh, so for example, now we have we had a rotation tag right there, but th we're not using that. Yep. Um, but you could have a set a list of tags like um, crouching, uh, wounded, uh, different gameplay state, or depending on you know what weapon you're holding, 
to have different implementations for these uh, uh, animations. So you don't have to like keep reprogramming. Um, I actually don't know why it's showing two rotation tags. Um, I think it's still probably, from the uh, from from the scopes, like uh, third and yeah, first no, person, right? So this this was from the uh, template code, and I forgot to remove them basically. So I um, we're not using them though. Um, so the template code was using uh, rotation tags. Yeah. Um, there was actually a really interesting question uh, on the last stream, which I was not able to answer properly. Yeah. Um, is there a, a way to separate motion um, from, for example, upper and lower body in mannequin? Uh, well, that's oh, okay. So that's a great question. So mannequin doesn't do that. Not that it can't. It's not its job to do that. Okay. Right. So that's cry animation. So what you could and should do um, is when you set up your scopes, uh, you should set up multiple layers uh, per each um, per each type of animation that you have. Um, so for example, you could set up like a full body layer and a full body scope and a top, top body scope and a bottom body scope, upper body, sorry, and lower body scopes. Um, and then uh, s assign those scopes to different layers in CryAnimation when you make them. Um, and then CryAnimation, uh, when you play an animation that is only set, is only has data for the upper body, and that layer is set to override, uh, then it will override the upper layers. So the CryAnimation works with a cascading concept of layers. You can have up to 32 layers on a character. Uh, and layers. so as long as you play the upper body animation on a lower layer, which is mean, mean it means when I say lower, it means higher number. So they go from zero to 31. Um, so what you usually would have will have is that you have maybe full body animation playing on layers zero to two or something. You usually, it's common uh, to uh, to allocate uh, two or three layers per scope, just in case you need an extra layer for some effect. Um, so you do maybe layers zero to three are for full body, then layers four to eight are for upper body, and layers nine to 12 are for uh, lower body. And yeah, that's, I mean, it's how we do it in Hunt. So it's, I mean, it's absolutely possible. It's just that the question itself is misplaced in the sense that Mannequin doesn't do that. Mannequin just passes the animations onto CryAnimation. It's CryAnimation that then processes them, processes them uh, in the order that they're uh, specified in the layers, and use uh, overriding the data that is specified in the animation. Oh, so okay. I hope that answers the question. And I hope, well, cause, yeah. cause ho hoping that the person that asked this last time is uh, still on. I, um, I think so. Yes. And if not, the the stream will be uploaded later on on, on on various platforms for you to watch, guys. So don't worry. Yeah, yeah Katline, so, Katline um, asked this question and I to think answer he's Gel Mega. Um, so today we're focusing on what is currently in uh, CryEngine 5.6. Um, I just want to say that all of the concepts that we talk about today are perfectly um, mappable to the new animation system that we're developing. There's not um, there's not anything that will flip your world upside down in the new animation system uh, compared to like how Mannequin works. It's just designed to be a little bit easier and more modular. Uh, but the concepts are, st are still the same. Uh, and there's a little bit, you know, more flexible maybe. But uh, right now we're focusing on 5.6 uh, stuff because, well, we can show stuff that is in the engine now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but, but when the other stuff come out, comes out, you can look at our roadmap. Definitely. And that's an update that's definitely worth um, looking forward to. I was just interesting um, about that since I, I haven't heard a lot about, um, about it at work. Um, so I, I don't understand the context behind that. So oh, yeah, oh, the uh, the gel mega is 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 one of us, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay, gel mega is uh, one of. Oh, it's the Yelte. Okay, got it. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think it's the uh, Yel mega at this point. But. 
Oh, yeah, okay. okay. So going back to what we're talking about, uh, so you have these implementations that are called fragments of these virtual motions or actions called uh, fragment IDs. And so on the right pane, you see the actual implementation of a fragment, which can be any number of animations on any number of scopes on any number of layers. And they can also be queued up in this timeline so that you can synchronize them. Obviously, this is a super simple implementation. So we're just passing this locomotion blend space onto the walk um, fragment, right? Um, yeah. So to show you something a little bit more complex, just a little bit, you can see how the jump fragment works. Um, oh yeah, so you, you can add layers there and everything. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm still still went back to the stream and I'm seeing your delayed screen. Wait. Oh, don't worry. There I am. Uh, so in the jump uh, in in the jump fragment. Um, you see that we have a jump animation. So this was taken from Mixamo. And it's actually kind of interesting because um, Roman or Josh, I don't remember who did it, but um, this was a full jump animation with a landing, right? I, I can so, even show it. Yeah, yeah. We have yeah, to just show the full them. animation, right? This is the and full so animation, yeah. This is the full animation we got from Mixamo. And the thing is, um, so this is how you do, I'm going to, maybe this is going to be not so news for some people that are in the stream, but as I was saying, um, Mixamo is, uh, the, the animation is pretty good, but uh, um, how we usually do animations in games, since the jump needs to be interactive. So we don't know the j length of the jump beforehand. Um, we can't have a full jump and fall um, animation, a full jump and land animation like this. Yeah. Uh, and so what you do usually, you have a takeoff, then you have a falling loop um, that can go on as long as needed um, and then you can have, and so that's the falling loop in this case, and then you can have a landing, right? Yeah. And so these are the uh, animations that we actually got. But since the jump from Mixamo actually included the landing as well, um, what Roman did is he cut it in the middle, right? So you can do this directly in Mannequin, yeah. no problem. I and so he only middle, included yeah. the first half of the jump and then just blended it to the falling idol and then the falling idol is looping, so this fragment goes on indefinitely. Yep, it sets here on so loop. It has a looping flag set on the properties pane. Uh, and yeah, this is something you can do. So you can make up little cues or little timelines of um, other animations. A uh, thing we use this for as well is to uh, synchronize gameplay events with animations. So for example, if you look at a hunt, um, Fragment is going to have, uh, well, first of all, it's going to have like three or four layers for different parts of the character and the gun and etc. And then you're going to have some layers which are for audio events or sounds um, and some other layers which are for um, gameplay events. So you're going to have, for example, the rumble of the gamepad, you edit it directly in Mannequin, right? Yeah. Or uh, the, the, the time stamp of the reload event is something you also edit direct, you can edit directly in mannequin these are called the procedural clips so you need to program yourself the logic of them they mm -hmm. don't just come out of the box but they're pretty simple to do um the funny thing is that i have something to admit here yeah so this jumping cut and the transition into falling idle right yeah, I, well, I you, you I was, cut it a little bit too too late right yeah yeah but 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 also the thing is that I wasn't really aware of this feature, so I just tried it out. It was like kind of um, oh, yeah, yeah. unintentionally like, hey, I don't know if that's possible, but maybe Mannequin is powerful enough to do that. And it, it, indeed, it was possible. Yeah, Mannequin <laughs> has lots of stuff. It's just that the the editor is kind of old, so some of it is difficult to find. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, But I think it's still a really powerful and cool tool. Now, as for the, the backend of Mannequin is, I mean, it's been used to ship like games that have pretty advanced animation systems. Yeah. So it, there's really it's pretty competitive when it comes to at least traditional animation techniques. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so we have all of this. We have these four animations, right? And so you want to see how how these are. Um, so uh, um, I guess somebody, uh, I guess we, you might want to see how you actually um, set up uh, the um, character 
before you go into the mannequin editor, right? And yeah. so I think uh, an interesting thing would be to look at the player controller file. So mannequin is uh, the an actual mannequin setup is made by a series of files. Um, and uh, if you maybe move to the animation folders on Windows Explorer. Animation Explorer? In the Windows Explorer, if you move to the animations folder. Uh, yes, on my way. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, wait, 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 just a second. Need... There we go. Yeah. So go in assets, animations, and then mannequin. Uh, before we continue, I would have a, just a short question. Yeah. Um, so Speed is, ma is, is um, asking you, is the new system going to be backwards uh, compatible yes. or going to have... Yeah, okay. That's all I needed to Um go. Yes. So it works like this. Right now we have it um, working like this. So you can switch. Uh, first of all, this is not nothing of... Not, mannequin is not going away. Nothing's going away. Everything works. If you have a game running with the old system and you don't want to change, works just as well as before, uh, possibly better, uh, because, well, we've been improving the back end still. Um, if you want to switch uh, and you're kind of in the middle of development, there's the first option is uh, you can switch on a character by character basis. Uh, so we already have this in the prototype. And so uh, you can have like a character who's running on the old system and a character who's running on the new system. Um, and uh, they can inhabit the same game world without any problems. Uh, then the second way that you can have backwards compatibility is um, there's, uh, and this is on our roadmap, it's not something we have in the prototype yet, but it's something we plan on putting in. Um, it's, called, it's a hybrid mode where uh, you can use the animation graph to merge the results of the two systems. So you can augment the your legacy stuff with the uh, new animation system if you want to add some stuff that is not possible with Mannequin while still running some of the stuff that you've done with Mannequin with Mannequin. And then the third way, which is, let's say, a stretch goal, uh, is to have a converter from a Mannequin setup to a new animation system setup. That's now, real. this, if, even if it happens, that's not going to be a perfect uh, exact fit. So uh, you're going to lose, even if we end up offering this, uh, it, there will be some data loss uh, because it's just the way of it. They 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 have they're based on the same concepts, but they don't exactly map one to one to each other. Um, but we possibly want to have a feature like this. Um, it's still up in the air whether we'll do it or not, or depending on how well we can make it work, if it's worth it to include. Um, so these are kind of like the three paths that we're thinking of for backwards compatibility, and I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that was an awesome answer. Um, so back to the folder again. Yes, I am in an animations folder right now. Yeah, so um, oh, I see the there's still a skeleton list, which is uh, not necessary anymore. But that's uh, exactly funny. yeah, that, that should be really <laughs> outdated, right? <laughs> I, think, I think we forgot to remove it from the templates because it doesn't really break anything to have it here, yeah. have it there. But uh, yeah, if you go into the mannequin folder, yeah, um, it, you you will be able. Oh, sorry, I'm still looking at the Twitch stream, so. Uh, yeah, so there's um, uh, we have three folders. Uh, fragment sequences is just for preview purposes. We, we can it's for debugging purposes. We cannot take a look at that. In the preview folder, we have the preview file, and this can be edited in the editor. But just to show you what's inside, uh, it's a really really simple file. Uh, just saying, you know, load this particular animation controller with this animation database with this character model. It's really simple. That's what it does. It just tells the editor, you know to load all of those three, four things together so that you don't have to specify it every time. Um, and then if you go back into the ADB folder, that's where the actual uh, content is. So obviously, Mannequin doesn't contain any animations by itself. It's just an organizational tool. Uh, but in these files, we have a controller definitions file, which is kind of like the head file of the controller. Um, and well, yeah, just if you go back to the folder and um, and we have uh, fragment IDs and tags files, which are definitions for what fragment IDs we have available and what tags we have available. And then we have a ADB, an animation database, which is the, all of the implementations of the fragment IDs for a specific character. Um, 
And so if we, we look at the controller definitions now at the file that you opened before. Um, so in here, uh, you see that we have the four scopes that we saw in the in the uh, editor, and we also have persistent and auto reinstall set for the idle. I'm going to explain later what that is. Uh, but uh, and you see, we also specify a context and tie that context to a layer zero on a character, uh, zero to two basically. So it's layer zero and num layers three. So this is where you set your layer associations. Uh, for a scope to character layer to the lower level animation system. So if I had more scopes, I could set the other scope to like layer four, num layers three, and so I'd have layer four, five, and six. Um, and uh, if you set different contexts, then that's an actual different character. So you can have, uh, that's why there's a definition for a scope context and then for the scope defs because each scope context is a character and each scope def is an actual mannequin layer. Uh, and so you could have multiple scopes on the same character. Like when you were talking, we were talking about uh, doing uh, full body or a top um, um, upper body, lower body, this is where you would set that up. Uh, and yes, to add, this file needs to be edited by hand. So this is the only file that needs to be edited by hand, but you need to edit it by hand if you want to change it. Uh, and then going back to the uh, folder, uh, yep. Sorry, I was just uh, typing something. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Uh, going back to the folder, um, uh, well, I don't want to really go into all these files because the others can be easily edited uh, in the uh, mannequin editor. Yeah. Uh, the, the ADB is what actually contains all of the information of the implementations that you made. And that's also an XML, so you can open it and look at it if you want, but it's like really not worth to mess through because it's really large. Uh, and this is really uh, better to edit uh, through the mannequin editor. But just to show you what it contains, this is it's even human readable if you want to you know, mess with it uh, or process it with a script or something like that. Yeah, I know that there's a, cup, a couple of our clients, I think, actually do something like that. Like they process their ADBs with scripts, uh, but I don't know what for. And I think it can get really, really complicated when you have a also a complex. Yeah, if you look setup. at the hunt one, it's yeah. like twenty thousand lines or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, this is kind of like what files a mannequin produces, right? So the the reason that they're all separate is that um, mannequin is kind of like a built. Um, to allow you to control any number of characters with a single controller. And then so this head controller, this controller definitions that you make, uh, you can set it so that it's connected to like multiple characters and then you would have a different ADB for each character implementation that you have while maintaining the same uh, high level gameplay logic that calls the same fragment IDs and the same tags. So that's kind of why all of the files are separated like this. Um, so if we go back to the um, uh, project, I think, you will recognize what we saw uh, in the XML files in the mannequin editor. Um, and so, again, we have these four uh, fragments. We have a scope on the right. You can see it as a, as a track on the timeline editor. Um, and this scope can have up to three layers. So if you actually right click it, uh, you can add anim layers to it. Um, so right now we really don't have anything to play on these, uh, but you know if you want, uh, you can add them uh, and play, I don't know, additive details or stuff like this. Obviously, if you play full body animations, then it's gonna override the upper layer, but uh, these tend to be used uh, for maybe adding an additive or uh, doing some tricky stuff that, uh, I mean, Artists are very nifty when you give them tools. Um, there's, a, there's a common saying between uh, programmers that if you... Uh, like if you give a designer a tool they, uh, that doesn't match what, they're, what they need it for, they're going to find a way to use it to do what they need to do. Uh, because, well, they need to ship the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, there is a um, question. Um, can you set a scope to a non-consecutive um, no. layers? No, nope. no, 
No, uh, only consecutive layers. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we have to create only the preview XML file, and then... Yes, all of the ADBs are created by the mannequin editor. You can edit the um, fragment IDs and the tags as well from the editor. And well, partially you can edit the uh, controller as well, but the layer stuff, um, I believe that you need to edit the XML for to mess up with the layers, mess around with the layers. Um, but uh, yeah, some of the stuff is actually just easier to do in XML because it's just numbers. Uh, so, I mean, depend depends on how comfortable you are with a text editor, but I mean, being that I'm a programmer, I sometimes edit stuff in XML for just because I don't want to run the, the entire, you know, the sandbox. Um, yeah, so this is how you set it up, but obviously we haven't shown really how gameplay code uh, ties into it, right? So yep. I think that would be interesting to go into the C++ project and take a look at uh, what we're actually doing in there. Exactly. Let's dive into the project. I will yeah. open the game uh, solution, correct? Yeah. 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 If you open the game solution, thank you. And then I will also uh, live share it with you. Yeah. If you share me the link, then I can control the... Um, thank you. Yep. And... God damn it. You again. There we go. Nick is asking how long your beard is. My beard is, it, it, it is short again. Like I, I thought during during the freaking pandemic, I would I would grow it, but then it became annoying. Mm. So now it's short again, really short. I look decent. I look decent. Yeah. Um, where do you want me to go? Um. Yeah. Just open the player.h and player.cpp files. Got it. So. Um, with project um, components and player.cpp and player.h. Let's start with, yeah, I can switch. I am following you currently. Should be able to see it. Okay, I see player.h. Yeah. Can you move to player cpp so I also load it? Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah. I have both. So now you can just follow me. In. All right, so, um, yeah, is it, is it moving on your screen? Yeah. If I do that, if I select, is it selecting? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so uh, this is the player component. Uh, if you had some programming sessions, you probably already saw it. Um, so Crangen, just to make it short, works with your run-of-the-mill component system with the component classes uh, that get uh, assigned to an entity, uh, kind of like well any other game engine that you, you, you've used, most likely. Um, so I kind of uh, fixed a little bit, fixed the template a little bit um, because uh, it was using some, I guess, outdated code. Uh, so if you compare this to what the template, uh, the third person template is, this is a little bit better. Um, so what we have um, is uh, a component that kind of does everything that the player character does. So this is not exactly, you know, proper uh, um, usually we tend to separate things so that they're easier to work with for different teams but this is for um, example's sake it's everything is, is all together so you normally would have a component that just works through the animation stuff right yep so if you look at if you look at the I think it's in the uh, I think it's in the yeah in the constructor here no and I think it's in the initialize function yeah there we go in the initialize function of this component, you can actually see uh, the other components that this component depends on being uh, created or well referenced. And so there's a character controller, and this is for just the uh, player gameplay stuff. So we don't really care about that. Well, we care about that, but later. And this is actually the animation component. So uh, this is a component called advanced animation component. Uh, it's just a little wrapper for a character. Um, you don't, if you're doing some more expert level stuff, you probably want to manage your own characters and not rely on this, but it's pretty good for starting out. Um, uh, and what it does is it just loads a character and uh, attaches a mannequin instance uh, to it so that you can send the mannequin events, uh, basically. And so uh, when you, after you load it, you set a bunch of uh, different strings 
and they're basically the ADB file. So where is the implementation for all of the stuff that you need? Uh, the character file, so the actual character model and skeleton and attachments that the character is made out of. So this is what you need to play and this is where you need to play it. Uh, and this last one is uh, the actual controller definition. So the interface to the animations. So all of the fr your fragment IDs and how the outside, uh, it's the definitions that the outside system uses to communicate with Mannequin. And then the last one is which scope context should this character be tied to, um, which well, we only have one, but we still need to specify it, which is third-person character. Um, I commented this out. Um, so the animation component provides a default fragment functionality, uh, but uh, I was doing, I'm, I'm doing things a little bit more explicitly here. And so I uh, commented it out and I'm doing it manually and I'll show you why just in a second. And uh, this is just for uh, determining whether we are uh, consuming uh, animation-driven motion or not. Uh, so the um, characters can have uh, the root joint animated and more often than not, you don't want that motion to actually be applied to the skeleton uh, because the uh, character skeleton will be offset from the capsule, the collision capsule that actually drives the movement of the character. So you actually want to consume that movement, basically delete it, save it somewhere else, and then maybe read it uh, for some gameplay effect if you need it. Uh, mo so most of the time you just want to remove it if there is any. Uh, and in some cases you want to actually uh, process it to get actual character movement out of it or, or out of or some other stuff. Um, here uh, we are just getting fragment IDs. Uh, this is just because um, Mannequin uses strings to determine fragment names, uh, but at runtime we use numbers for speed. And so this is just for converting the string into a number. This is nothing uh, fantascientific, uh, like it's nothing, it's not rocket science. Um, and so you basically end up with this initialized character that has been loaded, the mannequin controller has been initiated, everything has been bound, and then you have these fragment IDs that you can play with. Um, what I added to the template uh, are these uh, pointers, uh, I action pointers, to actual, actually hold our actions that we are playing. So an action is just a container for a, play, a fragment that is playing. Uh, back in the day, they were used to contain some gameplay logic, and you can still do it if you want. Uh, it's just not that recommended anymore because we figured out that uh, it's actually not a great pattern to have. Uh, the In some cases, uh, it's still useful. Like in locomotion, maybe you want to have an action that switches fragments, but that's a little bit more complicated. But you can think of an action just as a container for a fragment, and that's probably easy enough. And so instead of just passing the fragment ID to the uh, com component, and then the component instantiating the action for me, I'm actually instantiating the actions myself because I want to have a little bit of extra control after I played them. Uh, and so I sh I'm going to show you why. So most of the animation update actually happens in the uh, in this update function. So we have this uh, uh, process event, which just receives entity events from the entity system. And in the update uh, case, uh, we there's a, a part where we update animations, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the actual animation, the actual part where we update the animations. So um, this is where it is. And uh, this is kind of very different from the template because I kind of rewrote it from scratch just because I wanted to show something a little bit better. Uh, and so um, um, you see what I'm doing here. Um, uh, you can think of our actions uh, as being ranked uh, on a priority scale. Uh, so if we look at the idle action here, I'm checking if the idle action actually exists. And if not, I'm creating it and playing it. And you see that I'm passing a number at the beginning when I create this. Uh, and this uh, simple action is just a, uh, 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 sorry, wrong. Simple action is just a alias that I wrote here at the top of a player component for a T action of uh, S animation context, which is an inbuilt mannequin type for, again, creating simple actions uh, that don't have any logic. Uh, and this is most of what you need if you want to make your own actions and just 
save them and interact with them. All right, so um, what I do is I uh, create this action and I specify a priority value of zero. Um, and then I also specify that the action is interruptible. And what this means is that uh, this idle action will constantly play on the character uh, regardless of if other actions are playing on top. So if you play another action while idle is playing and this action has a higher priority, it will uninstall idle, play its course, and then when it's over, idle will be, you know, waiting in the shadows to reassert its dominance. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is kind of like to make sure I set it at the lowest priority level. And so it's kind of to make sure that if nothing is playing, idle will, ju will just take over. Um, and so this is this flag you can't pass if you use the simple, you know, function. So this is why I'm, I want a little bit more control um, and I'm creating it myself. Uh, I'm using the new operator uh, because this, these pointers are actually smart pointers, so they handle the memory deletion for me. Um, so idle will just play forever, and then the other actions are going to be played uh, depending on certain events uh, that I'm trying to detect. Uh, and so I'm actually detecting them with uh, what's called edge detection uh, code, which is really simple. Um, so I, I just want I want this to fire for only one frame, and so I don't want it to fire every frame that the character is on the ground because otherwise I will queue an endless list of actions and I will overload mannequin. So what I do is I actually check if the character was on the ground last frame, and this is a variable I created, and it's just being updated each at the end of each frame with the va value of this. Uh, so since since it's updated at the end of the frame. Uh, here it still has the value of the previous frame and so i can compare them and if they are different and if the character was on the ground last frame but this frame is not on the ground then i can cue the jump action and uh this is the same for walking and uh, for landing um so the reason i do this rather than uh what's in the template which is tracking the active uh, fragment is that when i when you try to track the active fragment, uh, first of all, there can be multiple active fragments. So that's not really true. And when you try to do that, you're basically trying to override the mannequin logic with a simpler logic uh, that is based on a state machine, and you're just making your life more difficult. So like this, instead, we're just relying on mannequin uh, knowing the priority that we've set up for each of these actions and knowing if an action is uh, valid to be played right now or not. So for example, um, you see that I, I set a priority of 10 for the landing animation, of 20 for the walk, and of 30 for the jump. There is a reason for this. Um, so the reason is, um, if I'm jumping while I'm walking, I want the jump to interrupt the walk. And then our landing animation is a standing land. So it doesn't look good if I'm moving. And so what I want is if I land and I am in the state that I could be walking to immediately transition to a walk. And so Mannequin just does this for me because I set the priorities correctly. The only additional thing that I need to do uh, is that the looping animations uh, are going to go on forever uh, because they're looping. So uh, uh, they, they're going to go on forever unless something else trumps them out of their slot. Uh, and so they're actually responsible themselves for unseating themselves when they're not relevant anymore. And so I put um, the, this, uh, this little piece of code so that the two looping actions that we have, so the walk and the jump, uh, because the jump is, has a falling loop at the end, so it continues indefinitely, um, they are, if they are existing and playing uh, and the condition is not valid anymore, then I stop them manually. And this is actually an, ends up being simpler than the template code, uh, just because I'm offloading some of the kind of intelligent logic to Mannequin, and Mannequin knows what to do because it's not it, it's not it's actually rather smart. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for the uh, how what we're doing with the fragments. Um, so uh, as it. Um, an interesting thing that came up uh, kind of an hour before we did this uh, is that um, the character is actually not uh, jumping uh, when it bounces on a bouncy platform. 
Uh, so since it's already in the jumping action, uh, the jumping action is not resetting. So I actually, let's see if I can, um, I actually had this changed on another window. Uh, there, is, uh, there are some questions. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, let's answer the questions but first. Before the question, um, Dila, Dila W. Bert, I think, says, Claudio explained really well, and I c could, couldn't you. agree more. <laughs> um, Willie, or, or Wiley, um, is asking, so changing priority of action at runtime, is it normal practice? Well, that's not at runtime, it's when I'm creating the action. So, well, you normally, you would have those stored somewhere. Uh, obviously, I'm just writing them as magic numbers for the sake of simplicity. And also, normally, you would not instantiate the action every time you queue it. Uh, you just leave it there and then requeue it. Again, I didn't do this for the sake of simplicity of the code. Um, yeah, I, Yelmega, Yelmega says that I use 10, 20, and 30 uh, just uh, because if I need to insert something in the middle, it's easier. But you can also use 1, 2, and 3. Uh, that's just my personal... Um, that's just my personal uh, habit, I guess. Uh, but usually you would not have them there as magic numbers. You just set like different types of um, priority as constants, and then you call on to these, those constants, which is what makes more sense. Um, yeah, let's look at the chat. Uh, that function name is confusing. Uh, no, so it was confusing, and then we changed it. Uh, and I can explain why. Um, so the reason is that when it's true, uh, the, the motion is driven by the animation. It means that we are consuming the animation data, the curve of the root motion, and we are passing it onto the entity system. Now, the, the reason that it disappears from the animation when it's true is that it's available for the entity system to consume. And if the entity system is doing nothing with it because you haven't written code that consumes it, then you're not going to see the motion anymore. But the current value, of, I inverted it exactly for this reason. So and this should be in 5.6, uh, the la latest, latest um, hotfix. Um, and so that's actually more correct as it is right now, rather than as it was before. Um, I hope that's that was clear enough. Um, so it's a bit con counterintuitive, but it makes sense if you think about it. Um, so going back to the code, I actually have a, um, like kind of like, I fixed it a little bit. I added a few more things uh, while Roman was preparing the stream. Um, and so, um, yeah, let me, pay, let me copy the code. Um, so what I added is a, a check um, to see if the character is falling downwards. Um, and we can see how, how to do that. So, um, And we do edge detection on that as well. So I added a... Are you, are, is it still uh, moving the view? Yep, it does. Yep. Okay, so I added a variable here called it was falling downwards. Um, and then I added to my... Uh, uh, constructor and set it up as false uh, to start with and then I add it uh, at the end of frame here so that um, each frame it's uh, updated by um, it looks at the velocity of the character and if it's um, the vertical velocity is negative it sets that to true uh, and it's a very simple pattern. It's nothing amazing. Again, it's, we're doing very simple code here just to get you something, uh, get something working quickly. Um, and so we now have this variable, which is updated on the basically the sign of the character velocity in the vertical axi axis uh, every frame. And so we can actually detect when the uh, sign of the velocity on the vertical axis changes. And so I can add this piece of code, and sorry for copy pasting it, but I, I mean, I have a pretty bad keyboard right now anyways, so uh, it's probably faster if I just just take it from uh, my project. Um, and so I added this 
to the um, pooping check. Here. So, you need to make a if here. Uh, the other thing that I did is that um, to detect if the so here, uh, in the case that the uh, character is oh yeah I also I had changed all of the pointers with the correct naming scheme but whatever uh, if the character is actually uh, f um, it's falling downwards but this frame it's falling upwards or well rising I guess yeah in video games you can fall upwards. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know it doesn't make any sense, but... Uh, so if this frame, I started falling upwards, it means that I probably uh, bounced on a platform or something. And we probably want to re-execute the jump fragment. So we just, I just remade a new, ac a new jump action. Now, there's a, there's a more sensible way that where you can actually re-queue the action. I just wanted to keep the code simplicity to a minimum with, so that I don't have to explain it. I know I'm like creating garbage, basically garbage memory right now. Uh, well, I, the garbage is being deleted because this is a smart pointer, but I'm, there's an excessive amount of allocations. My C++ pals will know what I'm talking about. I, I but, do, I do. Uh, but it works, <laughs> uh, so who cares? Um, and um, I also changed uh, the detection code for the uh, action being played because I noticed that the is playing fragment uh, is a little bit delayed, so there's actually another function that we can use. And it's a get status, and as long as the status is uh, smaller than exiting, then uh, this. Uh, well, sorry, I have an Italian keyboard, and all of the all of the symbols are in all of the wrong places. Gel Mega, you are hurting me, Cloud. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Gel Mega writes uh, says you are hurting me, Claudio. <laughs> Why am I hurting him? <laughs> oh yeah, Yelta. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, well. Just uh, deal with it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is definitely like a deal with it situation, I, I do believe that. Um, it's just that if I start explaining RAII, then we're never going to finish this stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I changed this uh, this check because it's actually, this works all the time. And the other one, there's a little, um, there's a little uh, frag fragment of time where the uh, action is not playing yet, it's transitioning into the action and that would not return true. So this actually works. And the other bug that I found was that if you start with the player in the air, uh, it will just start with the idle and it will not start jumping. And so I just covered the edge case with additional code. So that's just super easy. Um, so I just added a little check in the, um, in the uh, idle action code if the character is on the ground and I just need to change this. And so um, I think I can't compile it myself uh, so um, because I'm working remotely from your computer. But if you change this, uh, then it should uh, already uh, show that the, the bounce now should correctly play a new jump animation when you bounce. Uh, could you uh, compile the project? Yes, of course. Um, build solution. Oh, I, I have the engine still open. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I think this will yeah, probably it will not allow you to save the DLL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It does. It does a uh, lot of things now, uh, which is again uh, understandable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't need to save it. We didn't it. make any changes at level, did we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's closed now. Let's, let's, uh, let's build it again. Yeah. And if I didn't make any mistake. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. So if you run it again, we actually fixed it so that the action re-triggers itself when uh, the uh, character velocity changes uh, and goes up and down and somebody... Uh, <laughs> oh, somebody is tagging me on Discord because obviously... Oh, it was just Nick. Great. <laughs> Wait, where is... Oh, there it is. Um, oh, did I... Did I... Uh, swear again? Sorry. I, I, no, no, it's fine. I didn't even. I don't even notice. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, okay. We cannot sorry, walk I'm now. Very potty mounted. Uh, I'll try to be careful about it. Um, we are yeah, not able I, to walk I, now. Yeah, and I broke it. 
obviously. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> because I obviously broke it. Um, standard procedure, guys. Standard procedure. So let's see what I broke. Uh, I will close the engine it's not, again. No, 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 no. Just uh, do MN so we can show them how mannequin is debugged. Oh, w um, wait, 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 wait. Then I will restart it. Process F. <laughs> One minute. So we can actually take a look at what is actually what's happening instead of mannequin. This is a great example. Um, so you see, my um, uh, mistake, my F up, um, <laughs> my F up uh, actually turns out to be advantageous because now we can show the mannequin debugging feature. So if you type into the console mn underscore debug space um, while the game is running, though. Debug, yep, space. The game needs to be running. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, it doesn't work without the game running. Uh, yeah, debug, yeah. Just do the, yeah, so you can uh, do it in here. MN underscore debug, space, and then player zero with a capital P. Uh, this it. is just because our our our... Uh, this is just because our uh, um, uh, character, our entity is called player zero. It's not a special name or anything. It's just what the template calls the main player. And so if you look at it, now we can see what's happening. So this is stuck in a, a landing animation. Um, no, no, yeah, exactly. So it's stuck in a landing animation. And if you uh, jump, try jumping. So it's stuck in the landing for some reason. And... Um, yeah, very interesting. This is not what is uh, supposed to happen. Very uh, quite. Uh, um, so yeah, the um, I definitely uh, failed in uh, improving the code. Um, let's see if I can if can, if can, can figure it out uh, in a few minutes, in a few seconds. Um, Do you want me to go back to the code? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I'll be browsing it anyways. So. Okay, I am uh, closing the editor. Yeah. And switching back to code, and I'm following you again, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I kind of uh, destroyed oh, the uh, walking stop condition here when I copy pasted. This is your usual copy paste uh, error. So, yeah, uh, obviously, here I'm checking if the walk action is existing, if it's playing, and if it, the character is not walking. And I forgot to include this. So now it's just stopping the walk action <laughs> so yeah this is uh this is not uh, what supposed to happen okay so uh i think that's the fix that should be the fix um and build, I build it again yeah just build it again yeah and uh yeah this never this never happened before can, uh, trust me <laughs> pray to the compiler a oh, holy msvc give us a bug free program I have my little uh, Bjarne Strustrup shrine over here, and every time I press compile, I do a little, I do a little prayer, uh, just in case. Yeah, it looks how it's supposed to be. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, so you see, I'm not that stupid. <laughs> and so go try on the bouncy platforms. Yep, on my and way. Now uh, it should. Well, first of all, if you notice when you started the game, the animation was correct even in the air. Yeah. And now, uh, if you... Oh, yeah, uh, perfect. Yeah, and now if you go on the bouncy platform... He uh, even jumps yeah, out automatically. It jumps, yeah, it jumps automatically now when you go on the bouncy platform. That's, that's the change that I did, right? So that's we, because we're checking the uh, vertical velocity. Uh, oh, Yelte is asking if I have my rubber ducky. I don't have a rubber ducky. I have three plushies. Uh, one is of a stormtrooper. Oh, uh, the other one is of uh, a penguin. <laughs> and the other one is of uh, uh, Ziltoid, which is a, a character from a, a metal concept album from 2009. <laughs> An alien that wants to invade Earth to uh, raid us of, of our coffee. And this is uh, what I talk to, uh, who I talk to when I'm uh, in doubt of what to program. Yes, Devin Townsend. <laughs> great. It's your counsel. Yeah, it's like I call, I call it my great council, <laughs> and uh, each of each each one of them is uh, hung on each of my three screens uh, at work. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty weird, but uh, honestly, there's weirder desks than mine. So 
the Watership Council? <laughs> yeah, um, if anybody listens to metal, I highly recommend Devin Townsend, by the way. Great artist. Latest album just came out. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically it. Uh, we improved uh, the animations that we had. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know what's happening with those multiple landings, but... Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a problem with rotation as soon as I... I think those colliders are a bit iffy uh, because they're not um, straight. They're yeah. not level. Yeah. And so it might be re-triggering the jump for like a frame and then it re-lands. Could right? be, yeah, could be, yeah, definitely. But uh, it seems to be like fine that. when I rotate. And we, we could add like a check that he needs to be in the air for like more than four frames or something like that, or like more than... Uh, like a safe value or something like that to prevent that, I guess. Yep. Um, but, but I haven't done it. There's a lot to really improve, awesome. actually. So a landing animation, um, usually in a game, but you don't want to run it the exact moment that you hit the ground. Uh, you actually want to run it a few frames earlier. It's just that the prediction code uh, can tend to be... It's very uh, you know dark magic kind of stuff. So you need to basically guess that the character is going to land by doing some collider checks and then play the animation in advance. Uh, and you can totally do that. I um, uh, I don't know if I have the uh, time to do the check for four frames. Uh, Game Dev made, made easy, by the way. Great channel. Uh, nice uh, to see you here. Uh, sure, we could do that if we have the time. Um, yeah, so why not twist exactly? So to, to um, one of the simplest way to do the prediction is that you would... Uh, do a ray cast down and then calculate the remaining falling time. And then when the remaining falling time is below a certain threshold, then you run the landing animation in advance. The proper way to do it is to do a sweep test uh, over the actual falling trajectory. Um, so actually sweep the character over a parable. And that's the, the proper way to do it. Usually with a ray cast, um, you get it to a point that it doesn't really matter, but it depends of like on like how complicated the um, character geometry is in your level um so yeah i mean the a parable sweep is what you should use and the ray cast is what you end up using because you're too lazy um <laughs> and i mean i empathize with that uh yeah okay uh we can try to do that uh four frame check sure um so what we would do is we would turn the, I actually don't want to do it for frames. I want to turn it into a timer, maybe. Um, uh, because frames are frame dependent. Uh, so that's not really... Um, it, it will change the behavior depending on how fast the game is running. So what we do is if you turn back to the editor... Yeah. Um, we can actually uh, turn this uh, was on ground last frame to um, a float, maybe. Um, and... We can call it time since ground left or something. Wait, wait, he's like, still. Oh yeah, you're not looking at the. So I'll go back. He's still for some reason he he. Yeah, he does this. He is oh. not uh, um, playing any animation like idle. Uh, where? Sorry, uh, I, fo I stopped following your. Uh... Oh, let's debug this. So it's got into some uh, edge case. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go into mn mn underscore debug. Um, oh, it, and it keeps doing it, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, so he's stuck in a falling idol again. Yeah. Um, so this is weird because I set it to completely reset uh, when the uh, when you pr when you stop pressing play. Or maybe I didn't. Maybe I forgot to do that. Let me check. Um, so I can reproduce it if I just do nothing while, while um, spawning into the game. But if I will move during that, he oh, okay. Um, no, no. <laughs> so I, yeah, I have this reset animations function that at, when you leave game mode, it should reset everything and stop. Should um, we go back to code? Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to code. Okay. I'll just add a stop call for the um, for the reset animations. That should probably fix it. Okay. Uh, are you on, are you looking at code? Yep. So yeah, I have this reset animation functions that I run when you get out of edit mode, just so that we are sure that you know any nothing is running, um, and so we can just look. Uh, this is just uh, some boilerplate to stop everything. 
you you can make it you can make this more compact if you like um, what's wrong with this oh yeah um, stupid mistakes you can definitely make this a hundred times more compact if you like make a function for you know, a function and then call it for each of them but like I'm too lazy right now so I'm just gonna copy paste um, and what we're doing is we're stopping everything uh, when the um, uh, game when the character exits exits uh, game mode, so we're sure that everything is reset. There's no not no hanging state, anything like that. And then at the end, we just reset the character here. So if you then go out see how the animation controller does in this reset character, it uh, releases the action controller, releases the character, reloads everything. So that just that we're sure that um, there's no uh, outstanding state that get that influences your um, influences the. Um, um, the player too much. Uh, yeah, so again, um, we probably want to reset our counters as well in, in the reset uh, event. Yeah, let's do that. Just to be sure, you know? It's not like this is something that wouldn't happen in game, right? But it could happen um, it could happen in the editor and we just want to make sure that these are all reset so they behave as we expect. And I mean, you can organize all of this much, much better, but it's not the point of this uh, session, I guess, to show how to organize a more complex character. Um, and so, oh yeah, yes, um, game dev made easy. Wanted to see how to do the timer, so I would, uh, I guess, add another variable here and call it uh, time since left ground, right? And we can also add this to the ones that get reset. Oh, sorry, why did I do this? Jesus Christ! Boy, that was stupid. Um, and we can. Um, also add it to the constructor here, just to be sure that it's initialized, even though that probably will not happen. Um, and then we want to update this every frame that the character is not, um, that the character is not um, on the ground, we want to increase it. And while the character is on the ground, we just set it to zero. Right, and so we add it to the update here, and we just do like if characters on ground. Uh, um, time since left ground zero. And what did I do wrong this time? Okay. And in this case, we just increase it by the delta time, which is uh, here. And you can scold me as I'm going to use some magic numbers, but uh, who the hell care, cares at this point? Um, so a very common number in animation is 0 0.2. Um, it's uh, used almost as a like a religion. Whenever you need to transition between something and something else, just use 0 0.2. Um, and so we're going to use 0 0.2. Uh, don't ask me why. It's how I feel right now. I understand and, that. Uh, I'm going to be very offended if you question the number that I choose. I would never question your number <laughs> that you choose, especially not if, you're, if your council agrees with those numbers. Exactly. The council has informed me that they want me to use 0 0.2. Yeah. Um, and so what we want to do is uh, uh, when, he, when I force the landing action here, I actually want to add a check here that the, um, that the time... <laughs> He feels so oh, Italian point keyboard. This is, this is insane. I have all, all, of, all of my symbols are not in, not where they should be. Um, so we time since uh, I guess well the the variables are are uh, updated at the end of frame. So even if we are on the ground now, this is still gonna be you know a high number. So time since left ground. Uh, let's do oh sorry. Um, Come on, where are you? Okay, um, zero point two. Um, this should make it a little bit better. And if you have a 
you know, it could be a, could be higher, could be a second even if you want it. And so this should uh, do it if you build it. Um, I probably effed up something else, but knowing myself, I mean, it's a who knows this magic now? Is that from the why not twist? Is that from the fast square root or something? Uh, I think that might be where it, that's from. Yeah, that's from fast inverse square root. I know my dark magic when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I actually prefer zero. Uh, yeah, Cutlin said zero point one seven five. I am actually on the one, one zero point one seven five. I think zero point two is a little bit too much. Um, you can usually see uh, on Steam in trailers uh, Unity games and some Unreal games as well because I think that's the default there. But I remember it's a default in Unity transitions, where you know that they did not change their settings. Um, because you see all of the transitions are 0 0.2, uh, even those that don't make sense that should be faster or should be slower. And uh, you can spot that, uh, or at least I can. I don't know if you can spot that, but uh, try to notice it. Um, I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> frames are frame dependent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I tend to say uh, pretty stupid stuff. Um, yeah. Anyways, let's try to see if that worked. Let me let me build it. Oh yeah. By the way, guys, like programming practice. Uh, this is not not scientific. This is um, it's a bunch of different cargo cults uh, that are fighting each other, like different factions of a religion. Yeah. Um, and you just stick with one and hope that they're right. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, and um, I think that that little problem with the it, it happened a lot when you were on the beach on like diagonal surfaces. Yeah. I don't think we're gonna see it anymore. <laughs> Live advice from Claudio plus plus plus. Yeah, this seems to work now. Yeah, great. Um, so I guess the uh, last thing that we didn't show is the blend space parameters um, in the code. Um, those are really, really fast. And then if people want to ask some more questions, I can still be here and answer them. Yeah. Uh, so maybe let's go back to the code. And I am, I, I, I am back show. here. Oh, yeah. you're already back. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the... Um, I think it's still an update enemy. No, it's in somewhere else. Um, check. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, no, you know these because we're using locomotion, right? Yeah. So these uh, parameters are actually automatically passed by the advanced animation components component. If I recall correctly, so let's check if that's true. Um, we can go to the implementation of that. Um, and if I recall correctly, this is uh, setting some. No, it has no. It's, it has public functions to do that, so it doesn't do it. Okay. So we're doing it somewhere. Set motion parameter. So where did we do that? Set motion. Hmm. Okay. Then it's in the. It's in here. It's the default ones. Process event. Let's look at the update. So obviously, I don't remember the entire code base by by heart. So I, I hope you can excuse me, princess. Um, not yet, not yet. But you. Oh will. yeah, and this is this is compiled out. Uh, all right, so it's in uh, the CryEngine code base, but it's not in this header, so I can't show you the code. But I can show you how you can set uh, your own motion parameters. So uh, the point is that uh, we're using travel speed and travel angle. And those are very easy to uh, get automatically from a character controller. Uh, and I think that the animation com component uh, does it automatically uh, because it, we don't have code that does it here. So I'm assuming that it does. Um, <laughs> Game Dev Made Easy asks, um, I'm almost half tempted to ask when 5.7 will be released, but I know Nick will yell at me again for that. I do believe oh, so. 
he will yell at me as well. Yeah. So. He, he will help for, uh, yell at all of us. Well, I can answer that when it's done. Oh, I knew that this, this answer. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> um, the again, yeah. Intrig- yeah, I'm, I'm just double checking before I uh, say anything stupid. The again, no, no, it's, me it's well. automatically done. But if you wanted to do it, so th- because we're using the travel speed and travel angle uh, parameters, so those are kind of default for you know any moving object or entity. And so, advanced animation component, I believe it has a little piece of code calculates those uh, automatically. But the parameters you can use uh, up to seven default parameters and up to a- another eight custom ones. And so, what you would do is that advanced animation component has this uh, set motion parameter um, f- function, and they're all floats. And so in any of your updates, if you want to change the uh, parameters or if you want to override the parameters that uh, advanced animation component sets for you, we could do this in the animation update, for example, that we had here. Uh, and we could do something like this, uh, p animation component. My keyboard sucks, so I'm pressing shift when I shouldn't. We do set uh, motion parameter, and first parameter is an enum, uh, so it's a e motion. Ah, what, what the hell? What was it again? E motion prime id. Uh, and the second one, well, it's just one of these uh, enum members. So it's either one of the default ones here. So stop lag, travel angle, travel distance, travel slope, turn angle, blah blah. I mean, these really don't have any specific meaning. It's just that when the system was created, these were the ones that were used for crisis. Uh, And so they have a special number. And then you can have these custom blend weights um, from zero to seven. So let's say I have uh, a custom blend weight is like the vault height of my vaulting animation. And I can set it here. And I don't need this because it's a non-class enum and then I can set this vault height here so let's say it's like 1.5 meter tall and so you can it's just extremely simple and as soon as you pass this animation component is going to pass that onto the character instance and that's going to pass it onto the blend spaces and so that's how you get the parameters onto your character okay yeah, I think that's the last thing that I wanted to talk about so um uh yeah, does anybody have any additional questions yeah, about so let's, animation? Let's or maybe about the new animation system that we talked about with uh, Pavel on the talk that was released. Yeah, let's wait for the answers. I think there will be a lot of answers. So 5.7 will be released after 5.6 and before the next version. This seems weird, but do numbers really work like that? I think so. <laughs> might be very surprising to you, but uh, yes, it will be released before 5.8. Yeah, which is insane, but still. Would we be able to get some more advanced animation examples released? In particular, aim poses, slaves, 3040 blend spaces, chaining actions, uh, pose modifiers, and ragdoll blending. Okay, those are great questions. So, uh, 3040 blend spaces are already in Game SDK if you want to take a look at them. Um, there's also aim poses there, uh, and usage of aim poses. Um, slave animations, uh, well, that's technically still in Game SDK, but I, I can understand if that code is a bit dated, so if you don't want to browse it. Uh, those are definitely great suggestions. Um, we are looking to provide, to update the tutorials, but that's not something that I can really speak on, like if it will be done, when it will be done. Uh, sorry, the templates. If it will be done, when it will be done. It's not really, you know, what I work on. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I'll, I'll try to keep all of that in mind, all of those suggestions in mind, if it comes up that we uh, update the templates for the new system. And uh, about that, actually, after this stream, um, your and Pavel's talk will be uh, aired right, right straight after oh, on us the, on the Twitch stream. Yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be on Discord. If you guys have any questions, you can write on the um, on the uh, hashtag animation channel or whatever it's called. Um, other question. Uh, how about just bitch out other jokes? Do you know if time warping and segments are working? Yes, they're working. It's been a while since I've tried. Yes, they're currently absolutely, absolutely, sorry, effing working. Uh, I man- maintained them a little bit, a little while ago. There's no problem. They work perfectly. 
um about examples i think the game sdk blend spaces are all based on uh, t- they all have time warping enabled and they have segments for the um footsteps so yeah they work i'm pretty sure they do it's not the simplest thing to set up but uh it should be working um let's see mm. I thought numbers went five, seven, eight, seven, nine. Well, we should ask um, Microsoft how to count. Yes, and also when you get to nine, the next version needs to be a new major number, right? Yeah. Because th- there's no point then. <laughs> I mean, what's the point then? Even you know, say. for Apple, <laughs> I don't know about Apple. <laughs> yeah, so it's in the roadmap. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so. Answering speed is meh. Uh, it's in the roadmap. Um, it's uh, there's definitely going to be uh, parts of it released, um, but the uh, it probably will not be the entire thing that we talked about in the talk, right? So um, there there's uh, going to be uh elements of what you saw in the talk because that's a long term you know development strategy of like everything w- that we're working on uh, but uh yeah there's stuff that we're working on and it's pretty cool and you're gonna like it hopefully not i'm gonna be angry yeah if not um i will call the police <laughs> that's a great <laughs> idea just call the police Yeah, um, uh, I don't think I said anything that is not on the roadmap. So I just, if you, if I conflicted with anything that's on the roadmap, just the roadmap is right and I'm wrong. Yeah. I have to work with facial animations. Will there be video uh, video tutorials on this topic? I think I covered a little bit of it in my previous tutorials with um, with iClone. So I think the current process with um, with facial animations and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Claudio, yeah. uh, are actual blend shapes. Yes. So there's there's a thing that's a little bit confusing. Uh, yeah, uh, Nick, I'm sure you took a plane all the way to Italy to come slap me. <laughs> um, yeah. So about facial animation, it works just as in any other engine in the sense that well, facial animation is just another type of animation. There's not nothing really particular about it. Um, the reason that people get a bit confused about facial animation in CryEngine is because we have this facial editor, but the facial editor is just a phoneme editor. And it's uh, currently on a bit of a lifeline support just because we don't have time to uh, take a look at it. But these are features that are, uh, so the phoneme editor is something that you use to automatically match mouth shapes to audio when you have a lot of audio in a game. Uh, and it was used for uh, CryEngine, um, uh, sorry, Cry, uh, Crisis 3, and uh, I think Rise as well uses it. Um, and uh, the thing is, this type of tool is not in any engine publicly. Like each game usually has a custom implementation of something like this. So it's something we're including, like it's an extra, just be happy that it's there. It works, it's just, we haven't been really improving it for a while. Uh, but you don't need that to do facial animation. Uh, that's just for the phoneme stuff, for matching morphemes to phonemes. Uh, so facial animation is just done in two ways, really. It depends on your your character rig. And so what your rigger did, um, it um, um, there is a uh, um, you can do it with bones, and in that case, uh, it works exactly the same as rest of the character. A problem with bones is a little bit expensive. Uh, and the other way is d- using uh, blend shapes, also called uh, morph targets, uh, which is you have a set of meshes that all have the exact same vertex count, uh, and they, the vertices are displaced. Um, and uh, these uh, meshes are tied. The, the um, uh, You can blend in between these, again, targets and morph the mesh. And this is usually used in the face. Uh, and so in CryEngine, you can set up your rig so that there's a 
phantom bone at the root, which controls the weight for the um, the blend the blend shape, the morph target, uh, and then it works just like any other bone. So it's uh, pretty easy, and uh, we have tutorials about it, I think, and we have documentation on the docs. Uh, shouldn't be too hard, uh, and I remember we tested it last year, and it was still working pretty fine, and uh, there shouldn't be any problem with it. Yeah, so any all I need for facial animation in cutscenes is uh, blend shapes. It depends whether you want to use blend shapes or uh, bones. So, for example, Rise has both, actually, rigs, and it uses the bone rig when the characters are close and the blend shape rig when they're far away. And then when they're far, far away, it just disables them entirely. Uh, so it depends on what you want to do. And honestly, the the most complicated part about facial animations is not the engine. It's the rigging. Um, I hope you have a good rigger. It's so hard that there are riggers that are specifically specialized in just doing facial animations. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's and freaking hard to do this. It's more like one of an art problem or a technical art problem than like on our side, it's pretty easy. Have you guys done more uh, with getting Mixama models and animations to work better in CE? Or what do you mean by yeah. that? Uh, because we are currently using the Mixama model and Mixama animations. Yeah, yeah Mixama works okay. Um, Roman has been <laughs> I love helping that. a lot with this since he joined. He's really yeah. pushing for making Mixama work everywhere well. So I'm not like directly responsible for the importing process and the FBX uh, pipeline and all that, but FBX, um, it's not as smooth as the other pipelines simply because we don't use it internally, but we do test it. And I think all features work. Uh, they might be a tiny bit more difficult to set up. Uh, and if you have any problems with it, uh, feel free to, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll try to I'll try to. Oh, the root bone stuff that was, uh, Josh, the root bone stuff was fixed. Yes, that was fixed. I remember uh, that uh, being committed to. So that, that is fixed in 5.6. Um, so yeah, the FBX uh, pipeline is being worked on. I think every major version has had improvements. There are improvements in 5.6. There are improvements coming in 5.7. Uh, it's being taken seriously. I'm just not really the guy to speak about it because I only work on it occasionally. Um, so that's all sandbox team, and uh, they are. I, I'm. I don't want to speak for them, but the, the, I, th I think that it's uh, important to them that FBX works. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, it, was, it was also like a pretty important um, topic for me uh, to get. Yes, also, I, I think. Uh, uh, Blender is fine. Uh, I actually really like it um, personally. I like it a lot. Uh, Maya works. Max works. Whatever you you like. You need to find your own workflow. You know, like it's. Yep. With these technical tools, um, yeah, you can you can get far. You can get far with automation. And if there's some nice automation to let, get you started, it's a plus. But in the end, you need to understand how the engine thinks if you're going to do anything more advanced. Uh, so, yes, it, there might still be a little bit more of a um, uh, stepping, like a learning curve in using straight up FBX rather than, uh, you know, converting from Maya or from Max because we have these tools that we've been using for decades now. Um, but overall, you can do anything that you can do with uh, Maya with FBX. I don't think there's features that are missing. Um. So guys, I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please leave us a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you still have questions left, please join our Discord channel, where you will find some awesome community members that will help you if you have any questions. And also a huge thanks to Claudio for helping us with this live stream and giving some insight into the animation system of CryEngine. So thank you for watching and as always you will find all the links you need to our social media channels and of course to the official Discord channel in the video description down below. So follow us there and join the community channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.